Excellent. This is antiquated pearl. So, um, people sort of talk about modern pearl, and then you have the whole, you know, um, Larry called pearl a postmodern language, so uh, maybe there's postmodern pearl. And then, as I hope those of you who were in here before will now know, there is a um, been a movement coming um, for the past few years called Enlightening Pearl, which now has a non-profit organisation to support it. Um, and, okay, I guess everybody already knows that the um, Enlightened Pearl movement is built around things like Catalyst and DBIS Class and Moose, and I guess you all know I'm involved with those, but, um, I mean, what is modern Pearl? It, it means it's, it's, it's new, it's what's happening today, maybe, but... Uh, you know, so Pearl 5 version 10, uh, we've now seen 10.1, which is the uh, first full production release of the uh, version 10 series. Uh, provides things like the uh, wonderful given when construct, and the smart match operator, but... So what's the opposite of modern Pearl? Well, I guess you could say it's old Pearl, but old is, well, you know, old code. If it works, that's great, but other than that, it's not that exciting. Uh, legacy Pearl? Well, I could do an entire talk swearing about formmail.pl, but that's probably not that interesting. Um, if anybody wants to hear me swear about formmail.pl, buy me a beer later. Uh, so what I thought I'd talk about instead is antiquated Pearl. Uh, so I guess first we have to ask, uh, what do I mean by that? Well, antique. Um, antique doesn't just mean old. Uh, it means old and beautiful and things that have stood the test of time. Um, simple things, elegant things that um, let you do lots of clever stuff. And Pearl is full of things like that and we don't know about most of them. I mean, one of the, one of the simplest ones is the um, dollar pipe plus plus idiom. Uh, which is to turn auto flush on. Now, yes, you can load IO handle and call it as a method, and that's really nice, but and IO handle has been part of core for years, so you don't even need a module for it. But why think about it when you already know that setting dollar pipe to one does the job? Um, and it, it, there's all sorts of beautiful tricks around it, uh, like this one, um, which is to set auto flush on a particular file handle. What happens is you do select dollar foo, you select foo, which selects that file handle and returns the old one. Dollar pipe gets set, so auto flush gets set on the um, file handle you just selected. And then, because you take the first element of the array, you get the old file handle, which means that the select select foo idiom selects the foo file handle, sets it to auto flush, and then puts your default file handle back to it normally was. Now, okay, it's actually much prettier and cleaner just to load IO handle in that case and call auto flush straight on foo. But I, I think it's an example of one of the neat little tricks that we've um, had down the years. Um, and people go, ah, tilde tilde, the Pearl 510 smart, smart, smart match operator. Well, tilde tilde actually means something in old Pearl. You can do a tilde tilde at x. And the funny thing about that is, what it does is it means tilde of tilde of at x. Unary tilde put together twice. Um, now, tilde is bitwise negation. So what that means is, <laughs> now, it's bitwise negation, so it's a scalar operator. So it forces the right-hand side into scalar context. Oh, yuck. Now, <laughs> If you negate a number twice, you just get the number. Which means that tilde tilde is actually a short form for scalar. Um, and that's useful sometimes in one-liners. Um, as we have this lovely example that demonstrates why I'm not going to be using Moose as part of this talk, much though I love it. Um, but there's all sorts of fascinating things. Overload constant. You barely ever see it anymore. I mean, people use operator overloading, but overload constant lets you change the way Perl parses constants. Um, it's, it's built in, no C code required. You can affect how numbers and strings are parsed. You can parse all of those different types of strings with it. Um, so as an example, Audrey Tang wrote this fantastic module called I18n.pm, 
So you use I18F, and it grabs all of the strings that get made um, in the process of your module. And that means that you can do tilde tilde, uh, because it overloads the tilde operator, um, to get a much nicer syntax for localization, where you can use your variable names. And then that compiles down to a lookup into your um, lexicon of phrases. Um, and the humble four keyword. Pe people, are, you know, okay, for each loops, we all know that, but four has this wonderful property because it aliases to dollar underscore. So if you don't have things like given away, you can do four dollar foo, that puts it in dollar underscore, and now you can do things that um, expect dollar underscore. It effectively works as a with keyword for Perl, except built in, and it's always been there. Um, so you can build up um, switch statement style things by doing a test on dollar foo and then using a do block to return some sort of value. Uh, and then there's the interesting thing. Uh, I guess you all know about the G modifier on regex, but C says don't reset the match position even if this is a different regular expression, which means you can then use a different regex and instead of matching the start of the string, you use the backslash g marker, and that says carry on from where the other regular expression match. And if you've got that, you can build parsers with it. So you say, if it matches this, do a subparse. Inside the subparse routine, you do for, and you use the element of at underscore directly. Remember, at underscore is aliases, not copies. So it's the actual same scale of value, the same C scale of value under the hood. Which means when we do the submatch in the parser, it's matching from the position where the outer parser left off. And once you add in the built-in pause that allows you to get and set the position, you can actually do backtracking regular expression parsers with this, um, which has some interesting possibilities. Um, and subroutine prototypes. People go, oh, prototypes are a bad idea. I mean, mostly they are. About the only time you really want to use them is for the Ampersand prototype, which allows you to make built-in style things. So you declare a sub as um, Ampersand, and then it takes a block, which is how, for example, error.pm creates its try-catch stuff. Um, these days, I would suggest using try colon colon tiny uh, for lightweight stuff, and the... Um, Devil declare based try catch module when you're doing complicated stuff. But the principle is quite interesting. Uh, and the other interesting thing is there's a built in function called prototype. Nobody really pays much attention to it because it's not normally that useful, but it lets you get the prototype string for a subroutine so you can introspect it, see if it's been declared specially, and how its arguments work. Uh, which, by a slightly odd route, brings me to the humble type glob, the core of Perl. A symbol table, a package, is just a hash of type globs. And you can do things with that. So your um, way of building an exporter without using exporter.pm is that if you turn strict refs off, which I recommend you do only in the block you're using it, um, then you can actually install a method into a package by referencing the package name type glob and doing equal sub sets the code slot of the type glob which is exactly the same as a normal subroutine declaration does. Uh, but the really interesting thing about it, so, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, this is a different pun. Uh, so, local. People forget about local, oh, you should be using my for everything. But local has the interesting thing that it's dynamically scoped. It's scoped to the call stack, so if you do a local here and call something else, the local is still in scope over there, uh, which lets you do some fairly interesting things. Local dollar underscore, useful piece of defensive programming. More interestingly, you say, ah, well, I've been using croak in my code, but I need a verbose error in this page. So you say local star carp croak is carp confess. And then anywhere inside there, where you call croak, it does a confess instead and you get a full stack trace. So you can use that to turn stack traces on selectively just for the piece of code that you're trying to debug. So you don't take the overhead of generating the stack trace and you don't get big error messages 
except in the part of your code where there's the bug, which is what you're trying to look into. Um, and another thing you can do with local, this is, this is a beautiful trick. Setting local at argv and dollar slash. Because you provided no value for dollar slash, it becomes undef, which means slurp the entire file at once. By setting at argv to dollar file, you can use the built-in one-liner trick of um, empty um, file read, and that will read from the file. The really nice thing about this is, because Perl is clever, when it's going through at argv, if it gets an error opening a file, it throws it for you. So you don't actually need to put the or die in, and that's actually still safe code to slurp from a file. It can be very useful sometimes. Um, another thing, strict and warnings. We all know about strict and warnings, of course. But the way they're implemented is quite interesting. Um, strict arrow import actually sets a bunch of hint bits in a compiler internal variable that the Perl compiler uses to work out what it's doing. Um, so it affects the current compilation scope. It doesn't actually affect anything at runtime. Um, and warnings does the same thing for a special value called warning bits. Uh, which means you, you can, if you want, fiddle with those directly to turn strict and warnings on, but I would not recommend it. But the interesting thing about that is, because it's affecting the compilation scope, you don't have to worry about the caller or anything. The thing that matters is what the compiler's doing. So if you call strict import in another import routine, it affects the thing that's being compiled. So if you write a subroutine like this, that's the strict and warnings packages import method, that calls strict import and warnings import, then you can do use strict and warnings in your code, and that turns strict and warnings on for you. This is how Moose does it, by the way. Um, and you can use it for your own, even if you're not using Moose. If you have something that you use a lot in your applications, you can have that package turn them on for you so you don't have to type it out every time. Which I find very useful because I often want fatal warnings. Um, because I'd much rather the thing just died at the point at which I've done something stupid than printed to standard error and carried on. Um, Getting a bit further into the compiler, there's two sorts of hints. There is dollar hat h, which is a scalar, which is all, which is basically a big bit field that's tested from the C code, and percent hat h, which is a hash of information, which is used to store various context data that Perl needs. So you can do this interesting thing. If you add a magic set of bits to dollar hat h it localizes the hash, localizes it to the compilation scope. So that copy of percent hat %h now is going to go away when Perl hits the closing brace for the block that you're compiling. Which means, if you had a destructor to that, at the end of your compilation scope, percent hat %h goes back, the object you put in it goes away, and your destructor's called which means you can do cleanup. Rather than having to do use my module code, know my module, you can just have use my module and use this, and at the end of that block, the destructor can automatically unimport and clean up for you. Which means when you're fiddling around importing subroutines to make things easier, you can keep them scoped to a particular area so they don't affect the rest of the file, which allows you to write much more careful code. It allows you to scope your imports just like mine lets you scope your variables. Um, which is, I, I always think is a very good thing because I like using a lot of things that change the way Perl behaves. And I want it to only happen for the piece of code I used it in and not affect anything outside of it. Um, and the way you do it, because the package is just a hash of type blobs, you just delete the hash entry. And that gets rid of the um, import that you put into scope. Um, there is also B hooks end of scope, which does it a slightly more clever way using some C code. Um, and B hooks end of scope allows you to get around. There are certain issues if you do a string eval within a block, percent at H propagates. So if you 
if you've got a compiler handy, B hooks end of scope is the safe way to do this. We've gone through about four designs for this to get it absolutely right, and it's now very reliable. So I would recommend having a look at that if you're wanting to do scope things. Um, the other thing people forget about is tie. Okay, tie is, people go, oh, it's dirty, it's evil. Well, maybe, but sometimes it's really useful because it lets you affect um, how a variable is invoked and keep track of it. Um, it lets you make things do odd things. So, for example, um, if you have a routine that takes an array um, and you want it to um, deal with that array lazily because the array is actually from a database query, if you use a tied array, you can have the tied array fetch records from the database only as you loop through it and save yourself loading nearly as much data as you thought as you might otherwise have had to do. Um, the fascinating thing is, tie will work on scalars, arrays, and hashes, but you can also tie file handles, which lets you make things that look like a file handle, but do something completely different. So, for example, if you're trying to test your logging code, if you pass a tied file handle in for the file handle to log to, your write method on your tied handle is called instead of it actually printing anything out. And then you can collect that data and test it later, uh, which allows all sorts of interesting things. And if you've got code that's designed to read from a file, you can hand it a tied handle um, that causes it to read from a string or whatever. This is how things like IO Scalar and IO String work. Um, so, there's some interesting ideas. Um, now for something completely different. I was one of the, I, the only reason I'm marked as Moose Core Team is not because I'm a serious contributor. It's because when it was, when, um, it was first released, I started using it heavily and broke it again and again and again <laughs> and helped find lots and lots of bugs that now all of the people using Moose in production will never see. Um, for which Stephen was unaccountably grateful, even though I did drive him insane keeping breaking his code. So, destruction testing technology. Bend it as far as you can and see if it snaps. And funnily enough, I've been doing that since March 1983. Which also, funnily enough, is when I was born. <laughs> I destroyed my first piece of technology at three days old. Because the thing is, I got bored, apparently. So I, I was born two weeks early. So um, they had to put me in an incubator um, in order to keep the um, tiny annoying thing that grew up into the big annoying thing before you today uh, warm enough. So. An incubator. It's basically a big glass fish tank, yeah? With a plastic tray for the small annoying thing to sit on, and a heater underneath. There's a design flaw in that, <laughs> because there is a small gap between the plastic tray and the glass tank. Which is all fine, right up until the two-day-old baby in the incubator manages to pee at just the right angle. And it goes down the side of the glass Shots and out. reaches the electric motor. <laughs> so, in the spirit of this, I thought I'd take some of these tricks and see how far we can bend them without them breaking. Um, now, I discovered an interesting fact while I was messing around with prototypes which is that if you have an invalid prototype, something that contains something that makes no sense to pull, all you actually get at pass time is a warning. It doesn't become an error until you try and call that subroutine. So if you don't call it as a bare subroutine in your code, you never get an error. And I was, I'd been thinking for a while that I kind of liked the devil declare type syntax, but I wanted to be able to do it without having to build a load of C code. And I realized that because it's only a warning, I can put whatever I like in the prototype. So I thought, why don't I build a web dispatcher using this? So you have 
a, di a dispatch sub that takes subroutines with prototypes, and the prototypes specify what HTTP methods and URLs they take. Um, and then inside some code, I go through those subroutines, and I pull the prototype out, and then I pass it to a parser. And we already know how to build parsers. We use regex with slash GC, yeah? <laughs> so, what you can do is you loop around, parsing a section at a time, blow up if you can't find a section, skip the separator, and because pos gives you the position in the string, you can use a test of pos against the length of the string, and because this is dollar underscore, they both, you don't need to pass the argument, and that lets you find out when you've got to the end of the string and finished your parse. So, and blam was, well, I kept getting annoyed because I kept getting the syntax wrong, so we write a little routine called blam, which takes the position we're currently at, makes that many spaces, and a hat character. And that means you can produce nice errors that actually point out where the error was in your string while you were parsing it, in order to make it easier to get it right. Um, so then I was thinking, okay, well, we're doing a URL and it's got a section that's um, variable. So because it's variable, we're going to want to pass it as an argument. And that's great, but I've been using Musex declare too long. Fetching dollar self just annoys me now. I'm, I'm too used to not having to, because I just use a method keyword. So I thought, well, what can I do about that? I know. Let's create a dollar self global. So you do that by doing that, which creates basically a self reference to dollar self. Um, in fact, that um, idiom is exactly what use vars does, which is, of course, what we were all using before our was around. See? An antique, but still very useful. And then, you can write a routine that turns off strict references and sets a local dollar self to the current object. And then, if dollar run is a code ref, Perl, you see, when you, when you call a method, it's not just a method name it can take. And I'm sure most of us have passed a scalar with a method name in. But it turns out, you can pass a subroutine reference as well. And Perl invokes that as a method call. So my sub that I passed in earlier, if that's in dollar run, when I call it like that, I get the right dollar self, it's invoked as a method, and the arguments are passed through. So that seemed quite nice. And then I was thinking, how do we do HTML output? Because everybody knows that generating HTML just sucks. So, I thought, well, I could use templates. There's plenty of simple templating systems. But HTML isn't text, which is why generating it with template toolkit, while often the least worst choice, is still annoying. So I thought, well, I really kind of wish I could just put it straight in the Perl and um, generate it like that. And then I thought, actually, I can do that. Uh, because, well, what's that? It's, uh, oh God. it's a file handle call, yes, on the file handle in the glob div. Now, didn't we say we could do something with file handles? Well, you can tie them. So what you do is you tie the div glob to a special class that's a tied handle class that... We, um, and then what you do is you write a tie handle and a read line method. And when somebody does arrow div arrow, it invokes the read line method, which returns the value you passed in, and the value we passed in is arrow div arrow. So it returns the right HTML text. And then I went, well, that's great, but how do I handle that one? Because that's not a file handle call. Well, what it is, is it's actually a call to the glob built-in. Now, the nice thing about Perl built-ins is they have a namespace too, which is called core colon colon global. So you can replace them. So you set core co colon colon global colon colon glob to a subroutine that catches the string 
and return to the empty tag. And then, so you don't affect the rest of the program, you use the trick I showed, so that at the end of the scope, you delete your glob override back out of core global. So the rest of the program sees the real Perl glob if it uses it, and you don't break anything. Um, so now, you can do, use XML tags, div, and that's a file handle call, that's a glob call, both of them return the HTML you wanted, but as soon as we get to there, percent our H goes back, the destructor runs, and I can remove my magic file handle, and I can remove my magic glob function. So code outside of that never gets affected. Um, but then I thought, that's okay, but what about interpolation? Because you're going to want to pass in attributes, yes? So we're trying to pass in attributes and we go, okay, well, you know, we've got dollar stuff, we put it into an href, but it's got a quote in it. That's going to that's gonna completely wreck the HTML, yeah? So how do we deal with that? Well, it's a call to the glob routine with a string. Hmm. We already know how to change strings, don't we? So, what you do is, you see that Perl compiles it to that. So, once you've got overload constant in scope, that act, you can actually create objects out of those strings that have a stringify method that puts it back to the string so nothing else notices. And now you've got two objects. Now, now you've got objects, you can overload concatenation. At which point, you detect if what's been passed is another object like you, in which case it's a plain string and pass it through. If it isn't, it must be a variable and you can escape it. So, having done that, I thought, well, we need to hook this together. And really, you want to be able to make your HTML output just something that sits on the front of the rest of the application. So you could also have, say, an RSS output or a CSV output. So I implemented um, this syntax. So you have sub.html, which says, strip the .html off the end, but this isn't the dispatcher for the entire request. It needs to filter the response. So we're now using a subroutine with an at prototype, as mentioned before, and that's got a method call in it. But how do you tell the difference between that and any other return? Well, there's no reason you can't just bless the code ref. So you bless the code ref into that special class that indicates this is a filter, and then if you detect it's a response filter, instead of treating that as the end of dispatch, you call dispatch again with the remaining matches. So you have your .html match at the top, that then reruns dispatch with all of the rest of the matches going down, and then applies the HTML filter on the way out. So, having done all this, what's the end result? Well, go to app demo. I suppose I have to show you some code now. So, we have the fascinating bloggery module, because obviously if you're going to do a web app example, it has to be a blog. <laughs> So, we have a quick object that's doing a list of posts, uses file stat, that's another wonderful module because it means that the stat built in now returns an object and you can call methods on it instead of having to remember the numbers for all of the things you want. So, we look in the directory and we can use glob safely here, that's going to be the normal Perl glob because we already made sure XML tags was safe and didn't touch the rest of the program. Make sure that's not a summary, sort it for newest, and then produce post objects. Another quick routine to get post objects, and map so that you can call arrow map with a subroutine on your post list, rather than doing a straight uh, functional map. Um, and your post object is simple as well. Load it from a file, just bless up a an object. You can get the title just by pulling from the file name, and the data comes from local at argv dollar slash. So I don't have to worry about auto die or die, and I know I'll get an error if the file's not there. 
Um, and then we go into the actual application, package bloggery. Oh, and I forgot to mention, use web symbol at the top, imported strict <coughs> for me, imported all warnings fatal, except for the prototype ones, which it's turned off, so that I can use my dispatch syntax. And because I passed a package to it, it can then automatically set up the superclass of bloggery for me. So bloggery is now is a web simple application. So now, I have a method to get the post list object, a method to get a specific post, and I can write a nice simple dispatcher. If it's HTML, filter it through the HTML output. If we're getting on slash, redispatch to the index method. Um, if you've got anything, go and look for the post. And of course, we can use dollar self in there. Strict doesn't mind because we did the equivalent of use vars. And the local puts the right object in dollar self for us. And for the fallbacks, I'm just returning basic format. The, this array ref system, by the way, is what the new PSGI standard for um, per web server to web application interfaces specifies. Uh, the reference implementation of which is called PLAC. You will be able to find it on CPAN, you can find the master one on GitHub um, in Miyagawa's account. Um, and then your render HTML method, all you have to do is say to HTML string, and you can just construct your HTML. And we have a little helper package called HTML tags that exports XML tags for all of the standard HTML tags. And then when we get to the body content, we just do a switch on the type of object that we've loaded. Which means that if it's a post, we just return the HTML from the post file. And if we're doing the front page, we can now do a map call with our collection method and generate list items, all within Perl, clear what the HTML is, and because of the overload constant trick, we know that even if our dollar path contains HTML special values, it will get escaped correctly when it goes into the final HTML. And so, if we then run that CGI, we get a nice summary, simple summary page, we can load a post, and if we miss one, we get a text-based 404 response. So, this code is in the web simple repository under categits on git.shadowcat.co.uk. If you go to git.shadowcat.co.uk, you will be able to use GitWeb to browse the repository. And that is how to use antiquated Perl to make something new and interesting. Any questions? How do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> Why did you do that? <laughs> That's a question. Because it was fun. <laughs> Has Satan come for you already to get your soul? Or? Yes, she slided my talk yesterday. <laughs> I'm not selling my soul yet. I need at least another ten years to tarnish it some more and make it worth more. <laughs> Anybody else? All right, thank you very much.